We've been studying transitions, transitions that have taken place in the Bible so that we might learn from them. Today, I want to focus on the greatest transition of all. That is the final transition that we all experience. I'm talking about the transition that comes at the end of life. We call it death. The body dies. Interestingly, if you are a Christian, even death is not the final transition. There is one transition that occurs even after death. Sadly, tragically, not every human being will experience that ultimate and final transition. In past Bible lessons, I've noted that attendance in Christian churches in America has declined. It continues to do so. Presently, it is at an all-time historical low. This is tragic because it hinders the ability for many to prepare themselves for death. In the early 1950s, shortly after the end of World War II, fully 85% of U.S. citizens attended Christian churches regularly. In 2007, that figure was down to 78%. Today, fewer than 65% of Americans now say they go to church. Any church. If this rate of change continues at this pace, it is estimated that the majority of U.S. citizens will be non-Christian by 2035. That's according to social scientists who study this sort of phenomena. This has consequences, of course. Over time, it means that fewer and fewer Americans aren't taking their kids to church. Those who aren't being taken to church are less exposed to the gospel. Those who are less exposed to the gospel may not be born again. Those who are not born again, in turn, raise their families without attending church. The result is what has been termed a death spiral, a growing lack of exposure to biblical truth, fewer and fewer believers, and a serious decline in biblical knowledge. Some Bible prophecy experts tie the decline in biblical knowledge with shifting U.S. policy towards Israel. They also believe that the many natural disasters we've experienced recently in the U.S. are a direct result of America's declining support of Israel. I read that our former President Trump and our current national leader, President Biden, both propose a separate Palestinian state. Creating a separate nation called Palestine will divide the land of Israel, which we believers know was promised to the descendants of Abraham, the Israelites, not to the Palestinians. Even some Protestants support Israel less enthusiastically than they once did because so many churches today focus on social issues and feel-good sermons and the wealth and prosperity gospel rather than faithfully teaching the entire word of God. The bottom line is this, if you fail to study the Bible and all of the Bible, you won't know God fully, you will not obtain true wisdom, and you will never be in tune with what is going on in the world as it relates to the return of Jesus Christ. Bible scholars are also concerned about the recent U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. So am I. Many passages in the Old Testament are not being considered in such decision including this one in Ezekiel chapter 38. Son of man, turn your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Prophesy against him and say, this is what the Lord God says. Look, I am against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with all your army, including horses and riders, who are all splendidly dressed a huge company armed with shields and bucklers, all of them brandishing swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shields and helmets. Gomer with all its troops, and Beth Tegorma from the remotest parts of the north, along with all its troops. Many peoples are with you. These names mentioned in Ezekiel are largely unfamiliar to us today. They are the names of nations that exist today, but as they were known centuries before Jesus was born, 26 centuries ago. God told Ezekiel, turn your face to Gog and prophesy against him. Who is Gog? Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Ezekiel tells of an alliance of nations that comes together to invade Israel from the north. 
The Bible says Gog will lead this massive invasion force. The nations involved are identified in Ezekiel, but it helps to know those nations by their modern names. Here are the names they are known by today. Rosh is modern-day Russia. Magog are the regions of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, and several others. Persia is Iran. Kush is Sudan. Put is Libya. Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, and Beth to Gomer is modern-day Turkey. Until a few weeks ago, Afghanistan possessed a pro-U.S. government. American troops were based in that country. With us present there, it was extremely unlikely they would be involved in a coalition of nations that would attack Israel. That has now changed. With Islamic extremists back in power who refuse to recognize the nation of Israel, Afghanistan is now more than willing to join a holy war against Israel. Unfortunately, the USA left behind millions of dollars of modern military equipment to help them do it. This sets the stage for what Daniel called the time of the end. Bible scholars have long debated the role of the U.S. in end times. Many cite similarities between the Babylon described in the Bible book Revelation with the United States. If they are right, it doesn't bode well for America. After this, I saw another angel with great authority coming down from heaven, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. He cried in a mighty voice, It has fallen! Babylon the Great has fallen! She has become a dwelling for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, and a haunt for every unclean and despicable beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. The kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown wealthy from her excessive luxury. When I share these passages about Babylon with people, they often say, that doesn't sound like the America I know. And I agree. It's not the America we know, but it may be the America we are rapidly becoming. The kings of the earth who have committed sexual immorality and lived luxuriously with her will weep and mourn over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the mighty city, for in a single hour your judgment has come. The merchants of the earth will also weep and mourn over her because no one buys their merchandise any longer. Merchandise of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine fabrics of linen, purple, silk, and scarlet, all kinds of fragrant wood products, objects of ivory, objects of expensive wood, brass, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, and frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine wheat flour and grain, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages and slaves and human lives. The United States has traded in all the things mentioned in Revelation 18. If we were to cease overnight importing such things from around the world, naturally the merchants of the earth who supply those things will weep and mourn. Take America's purchasing power out of the equation and the entire world is thrown into instant economic chaos. America has also been a strong supporter of Israel. Since 1948, when Israel was reformed, we've been a staunch ally. Some say that without America's support, Israel could not have survived. And remember, God promised to bless those who bless Israel. I believe that America has been incredibly blessed in part because of our firm and solid historical support of the Israeli people. However, the alliance between the U.S. and Israel has been slowly weakening. More and more anti-Israel policies are being established by our government. We have a president who does not appear to understand biblical things. And some members of Congress today, at this very hour, are openly anti-Semitic. So, as our support of Israel weakens, some believe the U.S. will gradually fade as a world power. They predict that we will become, over time, unable or perhaps unwilling to help Israel in its future battles. 
But my friends, a gradual fading away is not what the Bible declares will happen. Whoa, whoa, the great city Babylon, the mighty city, for in a single hour your judgment has come. There's nothing gradual about what occurs in a single hour. And yet a quick demise of our nation has always seemed impossible. But is it? As we've seen recently with COVID-19, it doesn't take much to turn our world upside down. If you add an economic slowdown to the already fragile social fabric of our nation and throw in perhaps a major earthquake or another flood or a firestorm burning out of control and add to the mix yet another race riot or two, well, there's no telling how long our beloved home of the free and the brave will last. It may just rip apart at the seams. These United States have never been so disunited. And now, imagine if some nuclear weapon were tossed our direction, or perhaps one of those electromagnetic pulse bombs that disrupt telecommunications. Just imagine how such a weapon might wreak havoc amid a culture that lacks any influence of Christ Jesus in most of our citizens. In a single hour, America could be removed from the world stage as an international power. Turn off telecommunications and our economic power would disappear instantly. And we Americans would be so focused on our own challenges that we could no longer play the role of global cop. And with us out of the picture, in Afghanistan armed to the teeth, thanks to us, they're joining forces with like-minded haters of Israel seems a real possibility. The formation of a world coalition of nations, just as it's described in the book of Ezekiel, could arise quickly. My friends, that period the prophet Daniel called the time of the end has never been closer to becoming a reality. But never forget this truth. Our God is in control. And there is that one transition that every human being makes eventually anyway. We call it death. Our bodies, hearts beating, lungs filling with air, minds racing with a million simultaneous thoughts. All of that will one day cease. Death and taxes, they say, are the two unavoidables. Rich, poor, famous, the mighty and the weak, it comes to us all. It happened to one of the greatest leaders of all time, that one who led the children of Israel to the promised land. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which faces Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, all of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, and the region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms, as far as Zoar. The Lord then said to him, This is the land I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you will not cross into it. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, facing Beth Peor, and no one to this day knows where his grave is. Who buried Moses? Verse 6 says, he buried him. There is an alternate translation of this verse that reads simply, he was buried, but that is not an accurate translation. Correctly translated, it reads, he buried him. Who does the pronoun he reference? None other than Yahweh himself. That makes Moses' death and burial a one-off. No one else has been buried by God. But Moses was unique in so many ways. God took this stuttering man who once killed a man in Egypt and who fled for his life to survive 40 years in the desert and God turned this man into a national hero, a leader of his people, and a powerful speaker. And God used Moses' long and lonely experience, surviving in the desert those 40 years after killing the Egyptian, finding food and water, making shelter for himself from whatever he could scrounge, beating the heat of the day. God used those experiences to lead his people another 40 long years while wandering through the wilderness. The courage, wisdom, and humility of Moses is what saw them through. 
Those 40 years crossing the Sinai Peninsula should have taken at most 10 days to cross. Yet God used that time like a smelter to burn off the dross. It allowed a generation who had been slaves to either pass away and die or to become molded into a people of grit and determination. Those born along the way grew up hardy, having never been slaves, surviving, and even thriving in the wilderness. Together, the older generation and the younger were formed into a nation of people who could enter and conquer a land promised them centuries earlier. Verse 1 declares simply, Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah. That hike to the top of the mountain was surely one Moses made filled with mixed emotions. He was naturally elated, for after all those years he would finally see the promised land. At the same time, Moses knew he was going up there to die. God had told him so earlier. Go up Mount Nebo in the Eberim range in the land of Moab across from Jericho and view the land of Canaan I am giving the Israelites as a possession. Then you will die on the mountain that you go up and you will be gathered to your people just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. So Moses climbs that mountain knowing he will die alone atop Mount Nebo. His faith sustained him. Did you know Moses was the only person who ever spoke to God face to face? He was called Israel's greatest prophet. Moses is listed in Hebrews chapter 11 as a man of faith. His faith is a model for us to emulate. So why was he not allowed to enter the promised land? God told him why. Neither he nor his brother Aaron would enter. For both of you broke faith with me among the Israelites at the waters of Meribath Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin by failing to treat me as holy in their presence. Although from a distance you will view the land I am giving the Israelites, you will not go there. When we disobey God, when we break faith with him, invariably there are consequences. Don't believe for a moment that God does not see your sin. And when you sin, though you are forgiven and redeemed and loved by God, you will nevertheless deal with the consequences of your actions. In Deuteronomy 34, we read of Moses' final transition from this life to death. It's the one we all experience eventually. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not weak and his vitality had not left him. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days, and then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses came to an end. There is much sadness associated with death. Grief, crying, and pain are always present for those left behind. When we love a person, to be separated from them even temporarily is difficult, but somehow knowing that our separation is for the rest of our lives makes it all the more bitter and difficult. What's interesting is that Moses was yet vital when he died. Though he was 120 years old, God had kept him supernaturally fit. His eyes were not weak, the Bible says, and his vitality had not left him. Death is always saddest when someone youthful and physically fit dies. We don't expect it. For example, when someone who is in their 30s or 40s dies, it just doesn't feel right or even fair. I've performed funerals for 34-year-olds, for 16-year-olds, even infants. Such occasions are always sad and full of grief. They are almost always unbearable. They are, in fact, unbearable without God. God, of course, knows all. Our death is never unexpected to God. He knew the day you would be born, and God knows precisely the day you will pass away. But to us, death is always a surprise. To us, that final transition catches us off guard somehow. It just doesn't make sense. And because we look for explanations for death to make some sort of sense, we grasp at any reasonable logic to figure it out. There's a big problem with that. Logic fails us. You see, death is never reasonable. The Bible calls death our final battle. We all of us live under a shadow of death that hangs over us our entire lives. 
Death would indeed be unbearable if we had to face it without hope. But we Christians have hope. God has given us hope through his Son, Jesus Christ. Sooner or later, death visits us all. But the good news is this. Jesus has destroyed the power that death holds over us. In fact, Scripture tells us that for those who believe in Jesus, the moment our spirit is absent from the body, it is present immediately with the Lord. So actually, when a believer dies, after a period of mourning as the children of Israel did for Moses, it's an appropriate time to rejoice. For we Christians understand this truth when a believer passes away. He or she is with Jesus. Our Christian loved ones may be physically dead, but he or she is alive and well in heaven and reunited with many loved ones who have gone before. And Jesus is there with them. Oh yes, we all will die. That is, except for a relatively few who will not sleep, as the Bible puts it. They will not face death because they will be living on the day Jesus returns to earth. And something else remarkable happens that day. It will be the final transitions that believers go through. One last change before eternity. The Apostle Paul explained it to us. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the blink of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible must be clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal must be clothed with immortality. Oh yes, death comes, but death is not the final transition. That comes in a blink of an eye. I'm Rich Musler. Thank you for studying the Bible with me today. Lord willing, I'll see you next week.